Well, good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to this debate being put on by the Christian Union here at Cambridge University. It's lovely to see you all here. I'm going to hand straight over um, to our chair for the evening, who is uh, Sam Block. Sam is the co-director of debating at the Cambridge Union here. I'll also just introduce our speakers, first of all. So uh, on your left is Professor Gary Habermas from Liberty University, uh, Virginia, in the USA. And on your right is Dr. Arif Ahmed from our very own philosophy faculty. So I'll hand over to Sam straight away. Many thanks. OK, good evening, everyone. And many, thank many thanks for coming. And welcome to our debate today. The motion that we're going to be talking about this evening is this house believes that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Um, the speakers have already been introduced, so it leaves to me just to uh, run you briefly through the format for this evening. First of all, we're going to have 20 minutes uh, lecture by the Speaker of the Opposition, uh, then a 20-minute lecture by the Speaker of the Proposition. Following that, we'll have 25 minutes of discussion between the two speakers, and then an opportunity for you to ask questions. I'd like to call upon the Speaker of the Opposition, Dr. Arif Ahmed, to open his case. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes? OK. Um, I do sometimes tend to start speaking quite quickly and quite quietly, um, especially at the points of my argument that are weakest. So if any, of you, <laughs> if any of you notice that, then please shout out, obviously, especially those at the back. OK, well, I should start by introducing myself and telling you what my views are. I am an atheist, and that means that I don't believe in God, I don't believe in resurrection, either bodily or spiritual. I don't believe in a special providence. I don't believe in a future state. And I don't believe in anything supernatural. Now, when people tell me that they're atheists, they sometimes say something like, I'm a committed atheist or I'm a devout atheist. Um, and maybe it's just meant as a slightly feeble joke. But I wouldn't, myself, I wouldn't describe myself as a committed or a devout atheist. That is to say, I don't regard atheism as a position I hold as a matter of faith, nor do I regard it as one that I particularly want to hold or would be willing to continue to hold if the evidence were actually against it. I would quite like to believe um, in uh, a good God. I'd quite like to believe a number of supernatural claims, and I would particularly like to believe um, that I'll come back to life after my bodily death. The question is not, however, whether it would be a nice thing if it were true. The question is whether it is true. Now, the issue that we're debating tonight concerns bodily resurrection. And what this means, of course, is that Jesus came back from the dead, not just as a spirit, but as an actual physical body. It was, of course, a rather special physical body, because as you will know, it was one that was able to pass through walls, as St. John says. And the way in which I'm going to pursue the question, in fact, a way in which I think it's mandatory to pursue the question is simply on the basis of what empirical evidence there is uh, for settling this issue. Is there sufficient evidence for us to believe that Jesus did rise bodily from the dead, or if there is no sufficient empirical evidence, then we should either suspend belief and remain in a state of doubt, or we should positively believe that the event didn't happen. Now, before I go on to give my arguments, um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions that I'd like Professor Habermas to answer, if he'd be so kind, in his presentation. We all know that historians should be objective about their sources. That is to say, a competent historian, certainly one whom you would trust, is somebody who takes an attitude at least of skepticism, or if not of skepticism, then at least possible skepticism, towards the documents that concern him and which he treats as his historical sources. I don't know about you, but I've often had the experience when I read scholarly articles of seeing a mass of citations and lots of footnotes um, and all the other paraphernalia of, of uh, the scholarly world, finding it quite intimidating. And when I first read it, I think, gosh, this person must really know a lot about what he's talking about because he's got 48 footnotes, whereas this other guy has only got 12. A similar thing, of course, can happen in spoken debates. So, for instance, somebody might give a talk in which he cites a large number of scholars. He might say, 85% of scholars believe this, or the majority of scholarly opinion is this, or I've looked at all the scholarly works on this topic, and they all say such and such. Now, in a case like that, obviously, we can't check the claim that's being made. We're not in a position, because we don't have a text in front of us, 
and even if we did, we wouldn't have the time to check whether the claim that he makes is true. Therefore, we have to take it on trust. And that's why it's so important that a historian needs to be sceptical and objective. If he isn't, there are reasons for doubting what he says, and there are reasons for, for wondering whether we should indeed take on trust what he's asking us to take on trust. Perhaps the most spectacular example of this is a historian whose name most of you will know, uh, well, I call him a historian, the person I have in mind is David Irving. Many of you will know that he, he wrote a number of works in which he didn't deny, but certainly radically underplayed the extent of the Holocaust. Those works were copiously referenced and full of all the sort of scholarly paraphernalia that I've just mentioned. If I read it, or if you read it, or probably if anybody here read it, you would think, well, maybe he's got a case. He certainly looks like an expert about it. But I'm pleased to say that, of course, what he says was nonsense. Um, and I'm also quite proud to say that it was one of my colleagues in the history department here at Cambridge um, who was partly responsible for exposing the nonsense that it actually was. Now, that's a very dramatic example of a scholar who is not objective about his sources because, of course, this particular person was driven by the rather wicked beliefs that he had um, deliberately to bias and distort the scholarly opinions that he presents. And, of course, lay people will be in no position to check that. So now this, this gives rise to a couple of very simple questions for Gary. I'm sure he'll be able to answer them. And if he does, if he answers them in the way that I expect him to be able to, then, then this stumbling block is one that we can pass over very quickly. One question is whether he believes the Bible, the original Bible, is inerrant in all respects. If he thinks that everything in the Bible has to be true, I mean, for instance, the seven-day creation, the age of man extending to a thousand years, the parting of the Red Sea, the statement in Mark that people who believe in Jesus will be able to drink poison without harm. If he believes all of those things and he doesn't doubt any of them, then we have to start wondering just how objective a historical scholar he really is. Now, of course, I'm sure that he is an objective historical scholar. I'm sure he does have some skepticism about some of the historical claims in the Bible, and I'd be grateful if he could tell us just one or two one or two of those claims over which he has these doubts. I'm sure he'll be able to, and I'm not going to go back to the issue if he does. The last thing I'll say on this point is that you might say exactly the same about me. That is to say, you might say, well, look, here's this atheist. Isn't he rather arrogant coming along with all of these claims? Um, and he's got his own atheistic worldview, and he's presenting it. How do we know he isn't going to be biased and distort the evidence? Well, the answer is, the arguments that I'm going to present, at least tonight, are ones that you can all check straight away. They're not based on the consensus of historical opinion, of scholarly opinion, and I only cite, at least in the arguments I'm giving now, I only cite a scholarly article once, and that's one you can very easily check. Let's suppose then that uh, Gary's been able to answer the question that I started by asking him. And uh, let's move on now to the question of the evidence for the resurrection. Now, I'm not going to be concerned particularly, at least not at this stage, with minute analysis of the historical data. I'm going to allow quite wide latitude for what historical data we admit. In fact, I'm going to admit quite a lot. I'm going to suppose, though in fact this isn't true, that we have a great deal of contemporary written testimony about the resurrection. I'm going to suppose, though this isn't true, that the testimony was written by people who were entirely unbiased, all of them, who were skeptical and highly educated, um, and I'm, I'm going to assume uh, that we've got no other reasons for doubting what they say, other than the content of what they say. I claim that even then, we don't have a case for the resurrection that is worth a second look. Now, the first argument for this, I'm going to give three arguments for this claim. The first argument for this claim is the one that's listed as the first argument on your handout. And rather than go through it, I'm going to start by presenting an analogy in order to illustrate it. So let's imagine, uh, in the first case, that you have a pitcher of water, say a bucket of water, and you have a thermometer with which to measure it. Well, better, let's imagine not just that you have one, but that you have four or five thermometers with which to measure its temperature. And you put the thermometers in the bucket of water, and they say that it's 10 degrees C. And you put your hand in, and it feels quite cool, so you think, okay, that's, that's probably right. But now imagine that the thermometers say that the temperature was 30 degrees C. Now, you might put your hand in and think that's a bit odd because it's quite cool, indeed cooler than I normally feel water at that temperature to be, but nevertheless, maybe it's because there's something wrong with, with the way in which I detect heat by touch, and probably all of these thermometers are correct. 
Let's now suppose that the, thermometers re the thermometer readings are that the water is at a temperature of 600 degrees C and that the water is still in its liquid state. Now in that case, I don't think, in spite of the evidence, the independent evidence of all of these thermometers, I don't think you would say, ah, look, we've got water that isn't boiling, that's at 600 degrees C. What you would say is that we need to get a new thermometer. The reason that you would say that is, of course, this. We have never observed water, boil it, water not boiling at temperatures significantly above 100 degrees C at sea level. We have frequently observed thermometers going wrong. Therefore, the more likely hypothesis on the basis of the evidence we have is that the thermometer has gone wrong than that the water is at a liquid state, is in a liquid state at 600 degrees centigrade. Now, I hope the point of the analogy is clear, but let me just show how it applies to the argument at hand. We have frequently observed, the first thing I'll say is that we have frequently observed and verified beyond doubt that there are cases where skeptical, highly educated, independent witnesses testify to something that didn't happen. Now, the case I'm going to mention, this is, this is the one scholarly citation that I hope to have to make tonight. The case that I'm going to mention is one in a well-known study by Robert Buckhout in 1974, in which what happened was that he staged an assault on a university professor in California in front of 141 independent student witnesses. So these were highly educated people with no bias. Seven weeks later, not 10 years or five years, or however late it is that our first written testimony of the, uh, of the resurrection is, seven weeks later, he asked the students to identify the attacker, giving them a, a set of photographs. 60% of the people he asked positively identified the wrong person, including the victim of the attack itself. Now, there aren't, it's not just cases like that. There are dozens of other cases, including rather tragic real-life ones, where people have been convicted on the basis of independent eyewitness testimony. Um, and as it turns out, from later forensic evidence, the conviction was wrong. So we have clear cases where we have much better eyewitness testimony than we could possibly have had for the resurrection, which has turned out to be wrong. Now, moving on to number three, this is the third assumption, premise on the, on the first argument. Something we have never observed, ever, except possibly in the one case under dispute, and we can't assume that now, something we have never observed is either of these two things happening. The first one is that bodies come back to life after three days. We have never observed that. The second one is that solid bodies pass through solid rock. Certainly solid bodies the size of human beings have never been observed to pass through solid rock. These are things we have never, ever observed. It is therefore reasonable to suppose that it is more likely that in this case, the case of the resurrection, where the witness testimony is worse than in the Buckhat case, case I described earlier, it is more likely that the witnesses got it wrong than that the resurrection actually occurred. Now, the argument is the form of three premises and a conclusion. So one, two, and three are the premises, and four follows from them. If four is false, then one of one, two, and three must be false. So my next question for Gary is which one of those premises, one, two, and three, he denies, and why? Let me move on now to the second argument. The second argument is based on an assumption, I'll allow a certain assumption. I don't believe it's true, but let just, let's just suppose that it is true. Let's suppose that we've ruled out conclusively all the possible um, naturalistic explanations, that is, ones not involving supernatural intervention, all the possible naturalistic explanations for the evidence that we do have for the resurrection. Now, there are a variety of, a variety of such explanations. There's the theory that Jesus didn't really die when he was taken down from the cross. There's the theory that his body was stolen. There's the theory that there was a mass hallucination. There's the theory that they just all made it up. There are quite a few theories, but let's just suppose that we've conclusively refuted all of them. Many people say, for instance, nowadays, many people say that the theory, what's called the swoon theory, that is the theory that he didn't die on the cross, that theory is nonsense because it can be conclusively proved that somebody, or it's, it's incredibly unlikely that somebody who was crucified in the manner that the Romans did it 
would have survived it. Indeed, there may be only one case. There's one case I think Josephus mentions, but there's no other known case where somebody survives crucifixion. I do find it slightly surprising that the very people who are so insistent that you can't survive crucif that a body can't survive, survive crucifixion then happily go on to say that a body can survive death, but be that as it may, we'll move on to the, the argument. There are many cases where we find a phenomenon which has no known natural explanation, which later turns out to have a perfectly good one. Now, in some cases, that's just because we're ignorant of the facts, and later we discover certain historical facts that we didn't know at the time. In other cases, it's because we've discovered some new physical theory. These two cases aren't particularly... The difference between these two cases doesn't matter for my purposes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Nobody knew how the pyramids were built for a long time, and some people thought that that was evidence for either supernatural intervention or UFOs. Recently, we've discovered roughly how the pyramids were indeed built. Another example is the phenomenon of meteors. So rational and enlightenment person as Thomas Jefferson once said that he would sooner believe that the professors who testified to the existence of meteors, he would sooner believe that they were lying than that stones should fly from the sky. And many other people believe that it was a miraculous or supernatural event. We now know, of course, that there's a perfectly good natural explanation for meteor strikes, and although really noticeable ones are rare, nevertheless we can understand why they happen. Another example is lightning. Until Benjamin Franklin, many people thought that lightning was, again, some sort of supernatural phenomenon, but now we know it's simply a, a form of electricity. Now, let's think in particular about the case of hallucination. I'm not advocating the hallucination theory. I'm simply using it for illustrative purposes. There's plenty of things that we don't know about how the human mind works. Indeed, it's almost certain that the amount that we don't know about how the human brain and the human mind work far outweighs the amount that we do know, or that we even have an inkling of. Isn't it therefore reasonable to suppose that, hallucination might be an example, that there is some unknown natural explanation for the evidence that we have for the resurrection, rather than that there is a supernatural one? In all other cases where all known natural explanations have been ruled out, we've discovered that there was a then unknown natural explanation. That is, therefore, evidence on the basis of experience that this is what's happened in this case. Indeed, many Christians believe that God has made a very complex but very beautiful universe and that it's for us to discover its laws, though they be hidden from us. And somebody might adopt that attitude and indeed take also an attitude of what I think is the appropriate humility and suspend belief about the resurrection because he could say, well, there may be a natural explanation for the evidence, the evidence being the testimony of people like Paul, there may be an explanation for that, but we just don't yet know what it is. It does not follow that the explanation has to be supernatural. Let me move on now to my third argument. I'm now going to suppose the second argument admitted, though I don't think it's true, that all known explanations for the resurrection or for the testimony for the resurrection, have been conclusively ruled out. The third argument goes further. Let's suppose that I was wrong, okay? Let's suppose that not only is there no known natural explanation for the evidence that we have, namely the testimony that we have from St. Paul and others, there's no known natural explanation for that, and in fact, let's suppose there's no explanation at all that can be given by science. So let's suppose we've conclu proved conclusively, I don't know how on earth we could do it, but let's suppose that we've proved conclusively that not only science in its present state, but science in any possible future state could not explain the data that we have for postulating Jesus' bodily resurrection. Even then, I think we don't have grounds for believing that it took place. My reasoning for this is as follows. If we're allowed in postulating hypotheses that would explain what the disciples say they saw, or what Paul says the disciples say they saw. And if we're, al if we're allowed in explaining that to suspend certain regularities that we've observed, to, we've observed all the time, for instance, the regularity that solid bodies don't pass through rock, if we're allowed to suspend such laws as that, who's to say which ones we can suspend? 
and who's to say which ones we can't? Let me give you some examples. It has been said, there is a report in St. Paul that Jesus appeared not only himself, St. Paul, though that was last of all, but also before the disciples and also before 500. Now you might say that that was a hallucination and the argument that it wasn't a hallucination is something like this, that 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once. But the reason for thinking 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once is because we've never observed it. So given the evidence that we have, we have to drop, thank you, we have to drop one of two uh, general statements that we've observed. One of them is that bodies don't come back to life and solid objects don't pass through rock. The second one, which we could also drop, is that people don't have collective hallucinations. One of these two is false, okay, if we're allowed to assume some supernatural explanation. Let's suppose one of these two might be false, but who's to say which one we're to drop? Maybe there was a supernatural hallucination. So Jesus didn't really come back bodily from the dead. All of these people merely hallucinated that he did. I'm not saying it's likely, not at all. All I'm saying is that we've got no better reason to doubt that hypothesis than we have to doubt the hypothesis that he actually arose bodily from the dead. Both hypotheses go against everything we've experienced. So if we're willing to drop you know, beliefs about everything we've experienced, it seems to be either one could be dropped. So you've got no better reason to believe in bodily resurrection than in supernatural hallucination. That means I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude this argument. Exactly the same point apply, could, could apply to one of thousands of supernatural explanations. Maybe Jesus was kidnapped by Satan, who then put something else, somebody else who looked like Jesus in his place, and he was the one who appeared to everyone. That explains the evidence. That's a supernatural explanation. Why is that not to be preferred to the other supernatural explanations we've got? My point is that once you're in the game of dropping statements that we've seen to be confirmed by experience every day, for instance, that solid objects don't pass through rock, you can drop any one that you like. Just in my last 20 seconds, I'll just say one other thing. It seems to me that in all probability, most Christians who believe in the res resurrection do not believe in it because of the empirical evidence. It seems to me that most of them believe in it through faith. I'm not going to say anything against that view today, because as I said at the outset, that's not what I'm going to be, what I'm going to be looking at, nor I believe what Gary is going to be looking at. But if you do believe that, then perhaps, if, if that's Professor Havenmas's opinion, then perhaps he should come out and say it. Thank you very much. Okay, I thank uh, Dr. Ahmed very much for his speech, and I now call upon Professor Gabby, Gary Habermas to open the case for the proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, and for all who are involved in uh, staging this uh, dialogue or debate tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me um, first say a few things that I'm not saying, which will sort of uh, provide some parameters for my case tonight, then I will respond briefly to uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, questions. And then lastly, I will try to at least begin a case for the resurrection of Jesus. Some things I'm not saying tonight. Number one, I'm not saying faith alone or faith at all determines what facts I believe in. I want to discuss data. Um, in fact, I will say, if the evidence is not true, I'm willing to walk away from it. it I'm not going to say faith's going to keep drawing me back. I'm not going to argue tonight that the Bible tells me so. I will not argue that the Bible is inspired. I will not argue that the Bible is reliable. Nothing I say depends on the Bible being either uh, inspired or reliable. Dr. Ahmed asked me, Am I willing to say that certain things that are apparently taught in Scripture are mistaken or something to that effect? And sure, I have questions about all sorts of things. Seven-day creation, Genesis, I think that's one of the examples he gave. Yes, I have issues with that. If it turns out not to be true, I don't ha that's not even my position. So I, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. Uh, there's a universal flood by Noah. I mean, I, I, we can pick different things. But 
not only do I not have a problem or am I willing to admit issues, because I am, but secondly, nothing I say tonight will depend on inspiration or reliability. In other words, I'm going to make a case based on the vast majority of critical scholars and the vast majority of critical, very critical scholars, which I would define as skeptics, agnostics, or atheists. Thirdly, I will not argue that something is true because scholars say it's true. More about this in a moment. Yes, he made some comments about long end notes and long, and I, I do that a lot. I have some very long end notes with a lot of sources. But I don't think something's true just because scholars say so. As a matter of fact, if, here's, here's my general point. If this is a predominant view among scholars, conservative, moderate, and liberal, and even atheist, then probably there are some reasons why they share this view. So I will talk, talk both about scholarly consensus and real reasons for that consensus. Fourthly, I do not say, although I will start with scholarly consensus, I don't say everybody agrees with my conclusions, obviously. I am not going to argue tonight. I suppose we could be pushed there or moved there in the discussion period or maybe in the Q&A, but I, it's not part of my argument to argue that the resurrection is a miracle tonight, at least not by David Hume, Hume's definition. I'm going to argue that a man named Jesus of Nazareth died and that a man named Jesus of Nazareth appeared bodily. I'm not ask, answering or addressing the cause or did God reach down in history or did Satan reach down in history or uh, any of those possibilities. So I'm just asking, was Jesus seen bodily after he was raised? And I think that's consistent with the uh, proposition. I'll come back and say a little bit more about my method in a moment. Now, Dr. Ahmed has uh, three arguments on his sheet, and I'd like to address the first two. We can separate these two out, but I would like to make some general sorts of conclusions about uh, we could take this from a number of different viewpoints. David Hume's critical work, his essay on miracles, what scholars today call antecedent probability. But I would just make a few conclusions up front. What is possible or impossible in history depends a lot on one's presuppositions. For example, we're not discussing tonight, and, and ought not, but I mean we're not discussing tonight whether there's a God in the universe. But I am making the point that whether or not there is a God has a tremendous bearing on whether or not resurrections. If some of his first two cases in particular, or maybe all three arguments, say something like, it doesn't seem to me like resurrections can happen like this, I would say, all right, let's just say there are no natural resurrections in this world. But if there's a God for just, I'm, I'm just talking here about probabilities, not trying to address theism. But to answer his question, let's just say for a moment there's a God, something like the traditional God, just even on a, let's say, for example, basis. And let's say there's a, there is a God with roughly traditional attributes. For God to raise somebody from the dead would perhaps, arguably, make no more, take more, no more work than to say, rise or appear in the case of creation. I mean, that's possible. If your point is, we don't see these things happen in the natural world, maybe they don't come from the natural world. Now, I'm not arguing that today. I'm just addressing one of his conclusions. He says at the very end, third argument, what about the possibility of an hallucination? His last, very last statement of the sheet. Therefore, a supernatural resurrection is no more likely than a supernatural hallucination. Well, first of all, if he's going to assume... He's not saying this, but if he wants to allow a supernatural hallucination, if he wants to say Satan produces, we're talking about a realm that I suppose he's going to be a little bit uneasy with if he's an atheist and there's no supernatural world. But if all this is is something like this, let's say the, the, the objection goes this way. Um, what do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus, to use his example? What do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus? You say, well, I don't think that could be a, a, a miracle, which, again, I'm not going into miracle, but you could say, well, I don't think that happens today, you could say, well, on, on his behalf, you could say, well, you know what? Miracles don't ha uh, happen either. Resurrections don't happen either. Why not a one-time group hallucination? Okay, that's thoughtful. It really is, and he's not the first to propose it. But let's just say a solution, something like this. Group hallucinations are not possible, but it's more likely than a resurrection appearance. 
Okay, if you were to use that, in the early sources, we have more than one group appearance to Jesus. So if we're just going to post that out there for discussion, such as the 500 witnesses, no single group hallucination will solve the issue. We have several groups, even in the earliest list in 1 Corinthians 15. So what you end up with is something like this. If you want to use a natural event, like a group hallucination, to explain the resurrection, you have to do something like not group hallucination, one not the only one in history. You have to have group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination. Now I want to know which is more likely. Group hallucination, one-time event, which the only one happens here, we need four of them, or a resurrection appearance. I'm just saying things like that upset the apple cart, upset the balance of probabilities. I mentioned one earlier. If there's a God, it could be as easy as rise. If we're going to say group hallucinations, you could say, how many of them do you need? And how many of them are likely? There's some other issues with this sort of compounding of three arguments of uh, Professor Ahmed's. For example, we often hear, well, you need really good evidence, and not all evidence is good. And here's some problems with eyewitness evidence. It is still true in historiography, almost non existent in ancient historiography, but it's still true that we need early eyewitness data whenever possible. Our law courts in this country, across the ocean, U.S., we're based on that. Could somebody be lying? Yes. Could eyewitness testimony be wrong? Yes. Can we produce ex examples why eyewitness or early testimony are wrong? Yes. If it's that bad, why do we use it? And why is it considered empirical, at least in an historical sense? It's good data generally considered, and sometimes, often, it's the best data we have. So when you get to the New Testament, for example, it would be interesting if we had early eyewitness data. But good evidence does not mean, you have to have good evidence, does not mean, I need good evidence, I need good evidence, I need good evidence, and then you say, you know what? I don't think any evidence would convince me. Just like the question he asked me about the Bible, I would ask him, how much evidence would it take you to believe a resurrection if, for example, there were to be a God. Now, I want to emphasize this. This is not about theism tonight. I'm just saying it changes the probability structure considerably. In fact, a philosopher by the name of Owen, who champions this sort of approach, the antecedent probability, he says at the end of his article, if one puts God into the process, it totally upsets the apple cart. He said, I, I accept that critique, even though he's taken this response. Here's another one. George Mavrotis, and I'm still just referring to his uh, three arguments. George Mavrotis, in a critique of uh, David Hume and his argument, and arguments like it, in the International Journal for Philosophy and Religion, Mavrotis says the problem with these sorts of arguments goes something like this. David Hume says all of evidence is against the miracle. And, and Mavrotis says, well, what would that look like? In, if you have a small group and no evidence means you and your buddies at the pub or something like that, well, you might have a case where nobody's reporting miracles. But that kind of, a, that kind of an evidential eyewitness sort of uh, summary is not going to be enough to say survey says or all the evidence says or this is a representative sample. But says Mavrotis, the minute you start extending your sample, the minute you start saying, well, let's try to get a, a representative enough number to do some statistics here, you will have some miracle reports. Now, he might say, well, yeah, but let's dig in and check those things up. And I agree with him. I agree with him. Let's get in there and check them up. But some of these things, I think, and I don't think, I, again, not arguing miracles. I'm going to argue another class here in a moment. I think some of these are going to make the grade. A non-miraculous event that points to something beyond this world that I think violates his own beliefs that he said at the beginning. For example, if you say, well, and I think his, his three objections go in this direction. If you say, well, all, all things being considered, I'm going to choose something from the natural world. All things being considered, I'm not going to go with the resurrection appearance. Fine. How about something like near-death experiences? I, for example, I have here, just happen to have this. I wanted to read it on the plane, and I didn't get it done. But here are several articles of the famous Oxford philosopher, A.J. Ayer, who one year before he dies has two near-death experiences. 
He's an atheist. He says, I think these really happened. He said, I presented veridical evidence for this. And you know, I'm open, I'm more open to the afterlife. And I know a fellow who knew A.J. Ayer right before his death, he said he was really open to afterlife just before he died. Now, I've been studying near-death experiences for 30 years, and I'm going to say very, very briefly, there's some highly, highly evidential cases, not nice lights, nice travel, highly evidential cases. Professor Ahmed said, you know, it'd be nice to believe that I'll be raised later. Well, there are some cases that are so evidential, this doesn't make them prove, doesn't force them, but they've been written up, and from 10 to 20 different peer-reviewed medical journals have covered these cases. Largely public, we, we know the survey says kind of responses. We don't read the evidential ones. I'd be glad to discuss them. Well, why is this relevant? Because it upsets the evidential apple cart. It upsets the probabilistic apple cart of three philosophical arguments like these. Four, as I said, if there's a God, there could be a miracle, a resurrection like this. Not my argument about the miracle, but it could happen. Here's another one. If near-death experiences obtain, if there's evidence for afterlife, what's a resurrection? Specific case of afterlife. Wow. If we already have, in one survey in America, 8 million people who've experienced near-death phenomena, I'm only interested in the highly evidential ones. I've collected over 100 cases. I'd love to talk about some of these if any of you have a question. But here's my point. If certain afterlife cases, I'm going to say, well, are you a little bit more open to resurrection now? Does that open it up a little bit? So these sorts of considerations uh, move the evidence. And I would say if you heard some good evidential cases, you might say, hmm, now I'm really open, a little bit more open to what happened to Jesus. Okay, just some things to put on the table to answer his questions. His, four, his first lead question, then his three cases, four total. Uh, let me say some things about the resurrection of Jesus. And um, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to make this real fast. I'm going to talk about what the majority of scholars say. They frequently do not even address the issue of whether resurrection is a miracle, just of the data itself. Is, does the, excuse me, has the man Jesus died on the cross, and was he seen later, and if so, in what form? We could talk about different natural theories. Dr. Ackman is right. We could discuss one if you want. Today, you will find almost no scholarly dissension on the fact that Jesus died due to crucifixion. John Dominic Cross, and co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, a skeptic, does not believe in the resurrection. Uh, Marcus Borg, co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, both say that Jesus' death by crucifixion is as well attested as any event in the ancient world. Okay, now what's he seen afterwards? What's this based on? Many Christians will sort of punt to the Gospels. I think we can do that, but I'm not going to go there. Tonight I'm going to take a more unanimously contested case by contemporary critics, and it goes something like this. The case is that the Apostle Paul is the earliest witness we have. Michael Martin, an American atheist philosopher who wrote a case against Christianity, says the only eyewitness we have for a resurrection is Paul himself. Now I think we have more than that, but I'm saying that's how respectfully Paul's testimony is taken. I don't know anybody who will dispute the claim any of the following sentences, I shouldn't say anybody, the vast majority of critical scholarship, a New Testament scholarship, and I'm in the 95 to 100 range here, and I've counted. We can talk more about that later if you want. Here's some statements. The earliest disciples had experiences, real experiences, that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Conceded. I just published an article, two of them, peer-reviewed journals, not conservative journals, saying this is granted by almost everybody, published. I'm just saying it meant peer review. Second, Paul had an experience that he believed to be appearances of risen Jesus. Yes. James, the brother of Jesus, widely believed to be a skeptic of his own brother, had an experience that he believed to be an appearance of the risen Jesus. Two skeptics in this group now, Paul and James. When do we date these? And I remind you, in terms of historiography, we're looking for early eyewitnesses. The disciples may or may not, on my case so far, have written some Gospels. But those Gospels are only 40 to 60 years after the cross. And some people are going to say, that's far too far to make a difference in history. I'd say study ancient history. The earliest biography we have of Alexander is about 400 years after his death. Our main accounts for Julius Caesar are about a century and a half after his death. The Gospels at 40 to 60 are looking pretty good. 
You might say, well, yeah, but that's religious propaganda. Please, ask a question during the Q&A. I'd be glad to talk to you. Come back to Paul. Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15, conservative, liberal, virtually no difference, 55 AD. It's only 20 years after the cross. But most critics, I'm going to give you their conclusion. I'm going to cut right to this. Most critics believe that Paul received this material in Jerusalem from the apostles and eyewitnesses, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Peter denies his Lord. James is an unbeliever. Almost all New Testament scholars believe. Until he meets the risen Jesus, he meets them. They discuss the gospel, and Paul learns what they're believing. Of course, Paul was a recipient of an appearance much earlier. Now, this is only five years after the event. Now, he might say, well, look, five years is not two weeks, and two weeks even, you know, we even have a lot of errors after two weeks for early eyewitnesses. We do. But there's a reason it's the best evidence we produce today, generally, in courts of law. It's empirical evidence by, by the secondary historical standard. All right, so Paul gets this at plus five from them. But if Paul, if Paul received this material just five years after the cross, they had it before he did. And that's earlier. When do critics state this? Critics believe that this material comes from 30 AD, or, or whatever, death, whatever year you want to pick for the death of Jesus. It comes from that year. How do you know this? This is surely very conservative, right? No. First of all, the material is formalized into a, into a creed. It takes a while to pass things on like that. Garrett Ludeman, an atheist New Testament scholar, says the latest this formalization of the data could be is three years after the cross. The Jesus Seminar in America, who reject, who reject 80 to 90 percent of the red-letter words of Jesus in those translations of the Bible with, with the red letters, they say it's two years after the cross. And just recently, three major British scholars, Larry Hurtado, Edinburgh University, Richard Bauckham, he was here today, and he lives in Cambridge, but showed up today for a lecture at, at uh, Tyndale House. He's a great example, just retired from St. Andrews University. James D.G. Dunn, as influential as anybody in recent historical Jesus scholarship. And these three put the report at 30 A.D. Now, you can say whatever you want to about comparing this to 2008, but I'm going to tell you something. This makes a grade that is unbelievable in the ancient world. There's nothing like it. In fact, German, liberal German historian Hans von Kampenhausen said, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, meets all the prerequisites that we, could, that we could possibly have of an ancient text. Now, that's way back in the 60s he made that comment. But just recently, a book published by your own Cambridge University Press, What Can We Know About Jesus, by Howard Clark Key, an American theologian who, the only time I've met him, he was arguing for the agnostic position in the New Testament. This is an agnostic position. He begins his book by saying the data for the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 9.1 and 1 Corinthians 15.3 and following, where a list of Jesus' appearances is produced, Howard Clark Key begins his book by saying this could be tested in a normal court of law. He said, so good is this evidence that we could put it on trial today and get a positive verdict. Cambridge University Press, what can we know about Jesus? I'll bring this to a close. I don't think that the three arguments on this sheet are going to help us to rule out the resurrection. Now, now, what will they help us to do? These philosophical con concerns of Dr. Ahmed's are good. They are, because they help us caution evidence. But they cannot rule evidence out. And, they, and different things change evidence. If there's a God, the whole system changes. If near-death experience is obtained, the whole system changes. I'm saying we have here good data arrived at by scholars who do not believe in a resurrection, yet they say the data are good. And by the way, the trend today is for bodily resurrection. So I'd submit to you empirically that what we have is a case that says if we're open and, we're and events like this are possible, if, if life after death obtains, then we have to be open to ancient accounts that scholars put this kind of credit in that we can test it in a court of law. Okay, I thank both speakers very much for their speeches. And now we move into a period of informal discussion between the two. Um, so whoever would like to kick us off, um, feel ahead. free. Thank you. Perhaps I could start then. Um, there were a number of, thing, number of things in your talk that I wanted to pick up on. Perhaps very briefly we could start with the first point, because it would be very helpful. 
you said that you didn't have an issue with various events such as the seven day creation, the parting of the Red Sea and so on. Could you just please confirm, it would be very simple, you could do it in two seconds, that you think those things either didn't happen or it is doubtful that they happened? Yes. You were telling me, say, yeah, yes, that's fine. They yes. didn't happen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Or I'm doubtful, yes. Well, okay, thank you. Perhaps I can move on now to the next, uh, the next point, which is one that you, you brought up a number of times, which was that if eyewitness testimony is so bad as that, why do we use it in courts of law? Yeah, and I don't mean it's so bad. I just mean, can we find exceptions? Of course we can find exceptions, but does that invalidate eyewitness testimony? Not for a second. It doesn't invalidate eyewitness testimony. The point is not that eyewitness testimony is really bad or invalidated. The point is that given the evidence we have, eyewitness testimony get it, getting it wrong is more likely than solid bodies passing through rock. Oh, okay, okay, so you're saying, uh, let, let me make sure I understand this. You're saying we have more chance to accept an eyewitness what, someone says it passes through walk, and you say, chances are you're wrong? Yes. Okay. Now, then, this is not on God's existence, but would you allow that if, if there's a God, that can happen. If there's near-death experiences, there could be an afterlife. Any of this sort of thing changes data. For example, I, I don't want this to go anywhere, but to answer, I, I can't, we're not going to theistic debate, but, but to answer your question, would you say, if God existed, God could potentially take a body through rock? Is that possible? If a traditional theistic God existed, is that possible on theism? It's not a question of what's possible or not. It's a question of what's likely or not. Of course, it's logically possible in any case, whether or not God exists, that solid bodies should pass through rock. No contradiction is involved in it. But if God the created the world, take, taking a body through rock doesn't really seem like an issue, does it? If God doesn't exist, it's supremely unlikely. If God does exist and can do whatever he likes, I've got no way of judging what's more likely than what. Fair, but if that God... If that God judges evidence, if that God also says eyewitness testimony, if we can argue from the principles of Scripture that eyewitness testimony is good, early testimony is good, if God says things that indicate, let's just say, that certain scientific laws obtain, that there are even are laws of nature. In other words, if God is an evidence-granting God, an evidence uh, a God who recognizes evidence and who sets disciples up. Who, many authors in the New Testament say, I've checked these guys out, I've checked data out. If God is such who tells us, hey, he gives us these senses, he tells us to go after this data, it certainly changes things if there's a God. What, what do you say about the near-death experiences? If there's an afterlife, would you be more open? Or the question I ask you, what would it take for you to say, wow, resurrection is looking better and better right here? Okay, there's three questions there. The first question, as far as I understand it, seems to be, would I believe that solid bodies could pass through rock if God told me that they did? And the answer is no. Um, the second no, no, I, I'm asking about near death. It, like something, I'm saying, what would have to obtain for you to say, I'm really open to a resurrection? I'm saying, for example, if there were some highly evidential near-death experiences, and if we talked and talked and talked, and we, you came over and we walked a rugby, rugby match together, and at the end of the match you're going, yeah, you know, this is pretty interesting about near-death experiences. I've never heard any evidence like this. I'm saying, would you then be more open to a resurrection? Okay, good. Um, I think there's two points I'd like to make about near-death experiences. The first point, for those of you who don't know, what Gary's referring to by near-death experiences is cases where somebody, for instance, is being operated upon or somebody has an accident and their brain stops and their heart stops and then afterwards they report, for instance, having been out of their body or they report having seen lights and, and, and other sorts of uh, phenomena that we normally associate with consciousness. Now, there's two things I'd like to say about that. The first thing is that even if there were near-death experiences, that seems to me entirely irrelevant to the question of bodily resurrection. That's like confusing the, uh, confusing the statement that if a ship is wrecked, then the sailor survives, with the statement that if the ship is wrecked, then the ship survives. Even if, there's bodily, uh, even if there are near-death experiences, it has no bearing whatever on the reanimation of a corpse after three days, let alone on the question of whether solid bodies can pass through rock. The second thing I'd like to say, and I was hoping not to have to cite any other scholarly authorities, but it seems that I do. In summer 2007, the one journal um, uh, which is peer-reviewed and which covers this issue, which is the journal Near-Death Near Studies, um, published an article which said, no compelling evidence that near-death experiences can ex obtain uh, information from remote locations during their experiences has been forthcoming. Who, who's, the, who's the article? By uh, Professor Augustine. Okay, what he's not telling you is Keith Augustine is the executive director of philosophy. He's the executive director of Internet Infidels. He and I debated last year 
a 60-minute head-to-head debate. He, now, this is good because he specializes in near-death experiences, so obviously he should be able to blow Habermas's evidence away right off the bat. First comment, I'm not talking about a person who comes close to death and sees lights, as you said. I'm talking about a person who passes out, sorry to pick on you, right here in the room. <laughs> and we know that after a person has a real heart attack, they are heart dead and brain dead. Brain goes dead in 11 to 20 seconds empirically. You're out, obviously the debate's over, the guys rush in, they're working on you, and thankfully they get you, you're, you're going to live, you're going to be okay. <laughs> and one hour from now you're fine, but you say, hey, you know what, I was kind of up here above my body, and there's this really strange thing on the roof of this building, it can't be seen from anywhere, I saw an accident out here in the street, red car hits a yellow car, and we heard some sirens out there, we wonder what's going on. Make a long story short, let's say there's a police report on campus, these two cars hit, but we know you're brain dead when you report that, and you give it when you come back here. Now that's what Mr. Augustine and I were arguing about, and he knows the cases, right? So he and I, he, went, he did a three-part article there, a lot of data. He and I argued about a bunch of cases written up in medical journals, and um, let's just say, I, I don't want to look at me or look at this or look at that, he conceded the debate after it was over. So, so I mean, I'm just saying, don't say, here's the sentence, as if this solves the issue, and say, well, see, he, he concluded this. Also, what you're not saying is, and in that issue, there were, there were several responses from other scholars who asked, answered him and said, this is not a good response, and, and some of the top near-death researchers. I don't mean to go off over there, and you're right, it's not bodily resurrection. You're right, that's a good point. But here's my point. If there is an afterlife, if there's an afterlife, you've got to be more open to a specific case, no matter what kind of a specific case it is. Okay, there's two things I'd like to say about that. The first thing is that at best, what we, well, three things actually. The first thing is that, of course, in debates, debates are not always the best way to get at the truth, though I'm sure this one is. Um, <laughs> in debates, who wins is often down not only to who has the best case, but the, you know, the person who's the most forthright and the person who's, uh, you know, who's strongest on the day. It isn't always the best way to settle it. So you can't say because he's won the debate, therefore he's right. The second thing I would say is that at best, in this case, we have a case of what Hume called proof against proof. That is, we have one scholar saying one thing and another scholar saying another. In an issue as under-researched as near-death experiences are, and they most certainly are, and concerning an organ of the body, the brain, about which we know less than any other organ of the body, it seems unwise at this point to come to any definite conclusions. Um, and the final thing I'd, uh, I'd like to say is that, of course, the existence of near-death experiences, even if it were, even if they did exist, seems to me to have no bearing whatever and would not make me any more open at all to the statement that solid bodies pass through rock. Uh, uh, okay, and, and NDEs would not make you any more open to resurrection. No more. And, and, and I agree with you. Winning or losing a debate, there's no way, there's a, in fact, we talked about this this afternoon, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between winning a debate and truth. That's absolutely 100% true. But now you've made the comment two or three times that, that just because somebody... Uh, you know, just because somebody can talk about flat brain, flat heart, therefore that's all we know about heart. No, but you know what, I, I think that's, that's a, that shows a little bit of moving away from the data. If you say, okay, well look, all our machines show the heart's not working. All the machine shows the brain's not working. The person reports something out here, and there's a lot of cases like this, and someone reports the data out here, you say, you know what, maybe something's going on in the heart that we don't know about. First of all, these tests, we're pretty sure they're covering, certainly, you know, if the recorder's not working, so to speak, you're not going to see if somebody puts a hand across in front of you, let alone through that wall. And you could be sitting here in this room and not die, you're still alive, and you're still not going to be able to see an evident uh, car out there. So I don't think we're helping ourselves to say, well, maybe that's not all there is. Okay, let's say there's some subliminal brain activity doesn't involve seeing because we know it doesn't, but the person is correct. Anyway, I'm not trying to get off on that. I'm just, I'm just saying, if near-death experience, I'm just mentioning states in which you'd have to say, I'm open to data. Well, I mean, what would you say about the early evidence in, in Paul and getting back to uh, critics today saying, we can deal with Paul, James, Peter, their testimony, which we have without going to the Gospels, and we have their reports and they were willing to die for this. Now, one comment about willing to die. People are willing to die like crazy in our society. All, it doesn't require that what they say is true. It only requires 
that they really believe what they say. So my point is, if Paul, Peter, James, John really believe what they said was true, is, is it their, their sincerity confirmed by their willingness to die? Only they are in a position to know if they saw the risen Jesus. They could be mistaken, but only they are in a position to know. It would seem if you have skeptics and believers, Paul, James, the disciples, and they're willing to die, shows their sincerity, even if wrong, that would be an indication that what they are teaching is, as, as Key says here, singular in ancient history. And I don't think you're going to throw out ancient history. So what do you do with an observation? I'm not arguing miracle. Observation that the man who was dead was seen. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's three things I'd like to say about that. The first thing is the question as to whether, when you say they died for their beliefs, I'd like to know what the evidence is that they died for their belief in the resurrection. Great. I don't know what the evidence is for that. The second thing is, of course, people do die for things they believe to be true, but they also die for things that believe to be false. People change their lives for all sorts of reasons. In 1774, after Goethe's first novel was published, it was about a man who committed, a man who committed suicide, um, there was a wave of German youths dressing up in yellow breeches like the hero of the, the novel and then shooting themselves. None of them did it for something that they believe in. That's just an example of the, the kinds of vagaries of human psychology and the way in which people can change their lives for all kinds of reasons, need not be to do with belief. The third point is that, that of course, from somebody's actions, the only things that are visible are the beliefs that caused them, not the causes of those beliefs. So if somebody acts in a certain way, we can infer something about his beliefs, but we can't necessarily infer anything about the causes of his belief. Therefore, at best, we have a case, and only a partial one, for thinking that some of these people possibly believed in the, in the resurrection. That's okay. a long way from, from believing that it happened. Four people in this account that I gave, not using the Gospels, the four people again are Paul, Peter, James, and John. You say, what evidence do we have that they died for this belief? First of all, the evidence that they died. I do not claim that we can prove all the disciples died at X, Y, Z, but three of these four, their deaths, their martyrdoms are recorded within the first century. So we have very early reports. Jesus dies 30 AD, before the close of the New Testament, up front, before the close of the, well, same thing, before the close of the first century. Um, we have the reported martyrdoms of these three. You say, well, how do I know they died for resurrection? Because text after text after text, and I'll get, give you a bunch of verses in the New Testament if you're interested, but text after text after text, and I'm not taking it as inspired or reliable, I'm just saying, in these writers' minds, they say resurrection is a central belief. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, our faith is vain, you're still in your sin, your loved ones have died in Christ, we have nothing to live for. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he says, if Christ has, been, if Christ has uh, not been raised from the dead, we are of all men most miserable. I'm only saying by that, that resurrection is center of faith. There are virtually no disputants to that in this research. So they died for, what? for their faith. If you die for your faith, what is central to your faith is mostly likely on your list of what you're willing to die for. I'm just saying, all things considered, I, there's very few people who are, gonna, who are not going to concede that they died for what they believe to be true and what they gave their life to. Paul converted, James converted from other belief systems. So I think that points to something by way of, and don't forget, all we're trying to evidence here, what I'm trying to evidence, is that a man who died was seen later. They died for their central belief that they saw this man. Okay, one thing I would say about that is that it's not entirely clear that belief in the resurrection is, or always was, central to Christian belief. Otherwise, why would Paul have written to the, the Christians in Corinth to, say, uh, to, to propose the resurrection? Um, the second thing is that all that you've shown is that they died for some of their beliefs, and their beliefs included a belief in the resurrection. That does not entail, and it's a logical fallacy to think that it follows, that they died for their belief in the resurrection. I'm not quite clear what would show that, short of, for instance, a Roman official saying, I'm going to chop your head off unless you deny that Christ was resurrected. I don't know what the evidence is for saying well, I mean, anything you, like that. Do you want a verse that says, I, I mean, if, if they, they're going to say resurrection is central, they're going to say my hope of eternal life is based on resurrection. So we are talking about eternal life here. You started your, your talk with it. And of course, it's important to, to all of us, one way or the other. But if they say, for example, I, I mean, I'll give you many texts if you want, but if they say, 1 Peter 1 says, because of the resurrection of Jesus, heaven has been attained. You cannot take heaven away from us. And I'm sure about it. He said, you can rejoice with this, Peter talking. I'm sure of this. You can rejoice with this with, with, uh, uh, with the greatest of joy. He says, effervescent, flowing over joy. I'm just saying, there's no, there's no Christianity without a resurrection. 
You pull, Christi you pull the resurrection out, there's no Christianity. So to say they weren't willing to die for a resurrection, I think is to, to greatly misplace the, uh, the data. I, I think that if they died for it, you'd have to at least concede their sin sincerity. Once again, if you show one person in history, three, you know, there's almost no one in history who's willingly died for what they know to be a lie, unless the person has mental issues. But we die for things, if you willingly die, you, you mentally die, sorry, you willingly die for things that you believe to be true. So that is a witness, since they were in position to know if what they saw was real or not. Okay, well one thing I would say is that there is no doubt some question over the mental issues of the people in question. We've got no, no clear evidence that they were entirely, entirely sane. The second point is that whilst it may be true that whilst it may be true that all Christians today believe in resurrection, it seems to be the case that there were Christians, and you may say you can't be a Christian without believing in the resurrection, as St. Paul did, but there certainly were people who believed themselves to be followers of Jesus who did not or believe in or at least doubted who do you have, um, who do you have the resurrection. Well, why was he writing to Corinth? Who were the people in Corinth he was writing to? Well, because he, he took the gospel to a non-Jewish, non-Christian, obviously, center, a, a, a strong point of, I mean, a, a, a center where Greek philosophy is being taught. These are very young believers. He's simply, as a professor who's challenging his students, he's saying, hey, I was your birth father. I was the one that came here with the gospel, and that's what I was arguing here. And, and you guys have got it all wrong. You weren't listening to me, or you got it, you got it mixed up, or you're doing this. The book of 1 Corinthians is caught up with a whole bunch of things. They were, they were coming to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and they were coming drunk. And he said, you know, you really ought not be coming drunk. That's not really it. So just to say, because he was correcting them, therefore some early Christians must have believed. I'm talk this is about the earliest witnesses, not people who weren't witnesses, not people who were 20 years later. The earliest eyewitnesses who later were willing to die, that's the people I'm talking about, not Corinthians who were in a Greek culture who got it wrong, who were corrected by their master. Okay, so the, all we've established at best is that, well, well, at least I'm happy to see that you can see that there were Christians who didn't believe in resurrection, at least at that time. The second point is that, no, the second point is that all that's been established is, on the one hand, that St. Paul proclaimed the resurrection, and on the other hand, that St. Paul died. We still haven't got a reason, as far as I can see, for specifically saying that all of these, these people died for the resurrection. The third point is that we are now seem to be getting quite far from the question at hand, which is whether there's compelling evidence as to whether A, corpses reanimate in three days, and B, are able to pass through rock. Okay. okay. If we could just, uh, we have uh, five minutes left, so um, Professor Haugnas, if you have one final question, um, and then the other Thank one. Thank you. Yes, okay. I'm not, I, I'm not, okay, okay, you want me to just state a question, right? Not um, answer his previous. Um, if you want to answer that briefly, and then we just need to wrap up the statements. Okay. All right, I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll just pass on my, my comment. A question to you. I, I've asked a couple times now, under what conditions would you say, if this, if this obtained, now, I, you know, no, in fairness to you, you don't believe these things, but if this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. If this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. If this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. Um, for example, good data in the New Testament. For example, if your death experience is obtained. For example, I'm an atheist, but if there were a God, I could see passing through a rock as, what would it take for you to say, wow, I'm not there, but if I were, I'd be a little more open to considering this. I suppose what it would take for me is the same as the sort of thing that it would have taken for Hume to believe in a miracle. I didn't actually use the word miracle until now, certainly played no role in my argument, no, that's but, okay. but Hume in his essay did consider a case which would believe. He imagined the case of eight days of darkness over the earth, and he said that he would believe that it had actually happened if scholars from all countries of all levels of education, or at least of very high levels of education, who were skeptical, who had nothing to gain from proclaiming that particular message, um, all uh, uttered it, and perhaps also if there was some natural evidence that it had occurred. Now, something evidence as strong as that might be something like what would get me to believe that a, that a dead body can reanimate after three days. The kind of thing you would want would be something like, I mean, today it would have to be something that was done in a very prestigious laboratory with video cameras filming it all the time, dozens of people who had no interest in, no particular, nothing to gain from the result being one way or the other, making sworn testimonies. That would be the kind of thing that you would want. Okay. Concerning resurrection, I don't mean darkness, I mean resurrection.
concerning, concerning bodily reanimation, something like that might be, might be evidence, yeah. Okay, might and be. Dr. Ahmed, if you want one final question. Uh, yes, thanks very much. I'd like actually to take the opportunity to, to respond to a point that, um, that Gary made that I haven't yet had the chance to discuss, which is that he mentioned, he mentioned Hume, and in that context he mentioned uh, Mavrodis' objection to Hume. The objection, as far as I could understand it, seem to be that Hume assumes, uh, my argument isn't Hume's by the way, or if it is, that resemblance is, is only accidental, though obviously it bears some resemblance to Hume's. The argument against Hume was that Hume assumes that we have uniform testimony against miracles, but of course that assumption begs the question, because, um, because you could only know that we have uniform testimony against miracles if, um, uh, if you know that all testimony uh, in, fav sorry, in favor of miracles is false. Now, I nowhere assume that. I nowhere assume that we have uniform testimony in favor, uh, against miracles. Um, all I assume that we, that we have ev uh, extensive evidence against physical bodies passing through rock and corpses coming back to life in three days. I don't think anybody would doubt that. Um, it seems to me, therefore, that it's not entirely clear what's wrong, um, what's wrong with the first argument. Perhaps Gary could just wrap up by telling me the first argument, the second argument, and the third argument if the premises are true, the conclusion is also true in all three cases. So perhaps Gary could just summarize, it would be a useful way to summarize his position if he could tell us which of the premises in those three arguments he denies. Yes, l let, me, let me come about Hume directly. And yes, I, can, I will just say, I'm not accusing you of having used Hume, but Hume is behind a lot of this contemporary antecedent probability. So I started there and I made some comments. Hume also says, just before the end of part one of his famous essay, he says this. He says, it would be a miracle if a dead man should rise from the dead, for it has never been observed at any time. And he has no explanation. He goes right on. I, I think one of the things that I'm concerned about with those kind of observations is the, and I'm not saying you're doing this at all, seriously, but I prioritize objections that say, well, look, uh, I need some good evidence. Oh, there's some things here. Well, sorry, I'm not going to admit it no matter what. And I, I, don't, I don't say he's saying that. I'm just saying that's the same thing that comes out of this essay from Hume. Nothing amounts because there's a uniform case. Now, as far as what I would do in each case on these, on these um, arguments of Dr. Ahmed's, the three arguments, I would just say what, what I was trying to say over here when I first started was that different things obtained to change the argument. For example, I specifically responded to your third argument, that one I took by itself. And I specifically responded to uh, hallucinations, and somebody could say, well, group hallucinations. I'm not sure if you folks got my point. Sometimes, now, it's very hard to explain. Sometimes naturalists say, well, there are no such things as group hallucinations. But um, then again, there are no such things as resurrections. So I'll take group hallucinations. And I'm saying it's not group hallucination versus resurrection. It's group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination. Now what's looking better when they're not seen anywhere else? So I did respond to number three already. But I'm saying under first and the second one, I'm just saying different things can obtain in the universe that would entirely upset the apple cart. So for example, um, number four in the first argument, therefore it's more likely that the witnesses got it wrong. Well, witnesses can get things wrong. But for example, if God existed, I'm just posing these ifs in here, if God existed, God could take a body through rock and a witness could be right. If you want to make number four, if you want to press that to the nth degree, it's like we never have evidence for these things. And then incredible one-time events, like say a Big Bang, would never be evidence. We would never be able to prove a Big Bang, for example. Never, because it's a one-time event. Uh, we just don't have evidences. So I'm just saying many things can obtain. I, I suggested two, God's existence, near-death experiences. And all of a sudden, someone says, ah, well, that does change the picture. So I do think these can be trumped, but I specifically responded to that last one, and then I gave the other points to the first two. Okay. Well, I thank both of our speakers very much, and pausing only to try and get my head around the concept of an eyewitness testimony for the Big Bang. Um, we now open it up to you of the floor to have your say. Um, so first of all, we'd like a question for the proposition. That's to say, for Professor Habermas, um, someone who would like to ask him a question. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> There's a microphone coming your way, sir. Um, you haven't actually told us for the first, second, well, in particular, the first and second arguments, specifically which of the four points you are rejecting. Could you give us a number, please, for each of them? Um, okay. I mean, for example, 
In the first argument, okay, okay, third, let's go down there. The evidence gives reason for me to prefer one prop, a, a hypothesis over we should give them equal weight. The evidence gives no reason to prefer resurrection or any other supernatural explanation. Therefore, we could go with another one. I'm saying, if to, to go to number three, I'm saying if, if you have a case of groups who say, I've seen something, and you say, as in number three, therefore, we could have a case of uh, uh, hallucination, I'm saying it does not follow. It does not follow that just to say hallucination, one hallucination is not going to do it. So now if you want to say uh, uh, hallucination, 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 I'm saying overall it's going to break down with empirical, if you come back against this with empirical evidence. That's the point I was getting in on number three. Maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm not being clear. I don't know. Okay, and uh, you're right to reply. Thanks very much. Um, I couldn't discern an answer to the question in that, in that response. Um, the question being in the first argument, which of the first three sentences does he deny? In the second argument, which of the first three sentences does he deny? And in the third argument, which of the first two sentences does he deny? But I do think that Gary implicitly denied premise two of the third argument on the grounds that group hallucination or multiple hallucination, even if it was supernatural, is less likely than a single resurrection. That's what I took to be his argument. And that would be an argument against premise two. Let me just defend premise two in these words. If we're allowing supernatural events, so for instance, God can produce a resurrection or God can produce a hallucination, it seems to me that if he can click his fingers to produce a supernatural resurrection, he can also click his fingers to produce five hallucinations, or 505 if you wanted, or 513, whatever the number, whatever the number was. So it seems to me there's no reason to think that if you are allowing supernatural explanations, there's no reason whatever to think that multiple hallucinations, or multiple supernatural hallucinations, are any less plausible or easier to produce than a single resurrection. Okay. Um, do we have a question for the opposition? The gentleman next to the gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to understand your argument. Would you say that because you're an atheist, um, that makes you more skeptical of resurrection? Or would you say that you, in the beginning, you don't believe in resurrection, and because that's the essence of Christianity, that makes you an atheist? Um, like, like what, what's your starting point? I think, yes, this, this is a sensible question. So the question, for those of you who didn't hear it, the question was, do I deny resurrection because I'm an atheist, or I'm an, I'm an atheist um, because I deny resurrection? Well, I'm an atheist because I don't think there's any reason whatever, I can't see any good arguments for believing in God, and for the same reason I don't believe resurrection, so I guess I would probably take the second option. That is, I'm an atheist in part because I see no good evidence for the resurrection. Okay, sure reply. Well, I, I'm not, can't, I can't reply on his autobiography, but um, I, I would think, and, and we chatted today, and I have no reason to, I'm serious, I have no reason to question anything he's saying by way of his autobiographical comments. But just in general, sometimes people say they're open to things, they're not really, they say produce evidence, when you produce evidence, they say, and you can always say more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. Uh, real briefly, in the third ar argument, second premise, I was not arguing for supernatural hallucinations. Now, if you want to say, if you want to introduce that into it, God can give supernatural, God can give supernatural hallucinations, 513 or whatever. Yes, he can. Of course, if God gave a supernatural uh, hallucination, I guess we'd have a God. So I guess we'd have an issue here. But all I was saying was it could be that one appearance is more likely than several natural group hallucinations, we don't know them. Uh, other than that, I, I want you folks to know, this, this, this guy a, is a nice fella. I really, would like to, I really would like to be over here and we could talk and push each other 24-7. I don't question his, him personally. Okay. Um, if anyone has a question in abstention, that's to say for neither side in particular, I don't know who we get to answer it, but if anyone does. <laughs> um, a man over there has. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I guess, I mean, this is supporting really one side of the issue, but it's also disagreeing with both of the speakers slightly, so. Um, <laughs> um, in that, I think um, there's a slight mischaracterization of what the issue is in the passage from Corinthians, about whether the Corinthians believed in the resurrection, because I think um, Dr. Ahmed suggested that they didn't, and um, Professor Habermas, I think, conceded that when he needn't have. Um, and I think the, the issue in the, the, what the Corinthians were denying was, or were doubting, 
was not, I don't think, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. It was the future bodily resurrection of believers. And so Paul is arguing, he's, he, he lays out, this is what I proclaim, that Christ died, he raised, rose from the dead, and then he gives all this list of witnesses. And he's saying, on the basis of this, it's therefore inconsistent that you um, are denying the, the idea of bodily resurrection, uh, which is because of their Greek kind of philosophical beliefs in kind of the immortality of the soul rather than, um, rather than bodily resurrection. Um, so I think, yes, I mean, this, this passage is talking about the resurrection, but I think Paul is, he's, he's arguing from their belief in the resurrection of Jesus um, as a way of saying, therefore, you should get the rest of your kind of belief system um, in line with that in a way which is consistent with that. Okay, we'll give, give you a minute each, you must go. Thanks very much. I don't have, I don't have too much to say in response to that, to that clarification, but I'm most grateful for it. I thought, Gary will correct me on this, I thought he said, if Jesus wasn't raised, then your belief in my preaching is in vain. Is that right? That's Paul. Yes, he did say that in 1 Corinthians. Yeah, but, yeah, I'm not sure. If Jesus I, isn't raised. Pardon me? He did if say Jesus that. Jesus has not been raised, and then in verse 19, he says, if he's not been raised, we are of all men most miserable. So everything depends. That's a centrality claim. Okay, so that seems to be evidence that at least part of his intention was to make them was to, was to convince them to believe that Jesus was raised. That was on, on what I based my, my conjecture. Yeah, but I, 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 no, I think he's raising a really good point here. And now, now on, on his behalf, let me argue for him for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he could just go on and say, but p supposedly some Christians could have different you know, options about this. But I, but I do, you know, on resurrection. But I do want to say this. In the Corinthian account, if that was his objection, if that's what you're after, if his objection is you have some early believers in Corinth who deny the resurrection, if, if that was it, that definitely is a good point. They didn't deny resurrection. In fact, there's some different ag agreements. I mean, we don't know what they were saying because we don't have their side. But it seems that they were trying to say, Jesus has been raised, but he's perhaps been raised in a little more platonic, less bodily sense, but he's definitely been raised. Yeah, I don't think anybody thinks the Corinthians didn't believe in resurrection. So if that's the point, you'd have to look pretty hard to find cases of Christians in the, in the first 20 years who didn't believe in resurrection. I think that's critical. Okay, um, we're getting on in terms of time now, so questions could be kept brief. Anyone in, for the proposition? Um, yeah, a gentleman towards the back there. Yeah, my, my question <clears throat> is, um, when we look at the history of the resurrection 2,000 years ago, certainly this is something that's been removed from our time today to look at observably in a laboratory or in a scientific investigation. So my question would be, how is it possible that if 2,000 years ago, if Jesus Christ did not rise again in bodily form, how can we explain that the resurrection could have even been carried on throughout history when you consider the fact that this should have been the easiest event to disprove in the history of the world because Saul of Tarsus was taught by Gamaliel and he converted. You have all of the Roman leaders, when we talk about uh, Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, when we talk about uh, Herod Antipas, when we talk about these different people, and the fact that Christianity spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, this should have been the easiest event to disprove because all they would have had to do was bring out the body. So how do we explain the fact that Christianity could survive and that so many lives have been changed to this point by the power of Jesus Christ because he's risen again from the dead? <laughs> and I would like to ask how that could be uh, that proven. Um, okay, I, I believe that was in fact a question to the opposition. Um, <laughs> just an inkling. Um, in which case we'll uh, let Dr. Ahmed uh, answer this one and then go for another one really for proposition. Thank you very much. Um, I, think, I think there's three points I'd like to make in response to that question. Um, the first point is that because a religion has many adherents and spreads quickly, there's no reason for thinking its premises are true. Indeed, that's most unlikely because there are, there are many religions, Islam spread even quicker than Christianity, and there are many religions who have you know, almost as many adherents as Christianity today and have spread just as quickly and of course you presumably would hold their tenets to be false. Um, the second point is that um, after three days in Judea I'd have thought a body would have decomposed so much as to be unrecognizable and therefore it would, it's not entirely clear to me how the Romans would have, um, even if they'd wanted to, how they would have managed to disprove the resurrection. 
Um, the third point is that we do have some evidence that religions continue to exist and their believers continue to cling on to their faith even after the premises of the religion have been disproved. There are still, for instance, branch Dravidians around, I mean the followers of, of, uh, of David Koresh, and the Mormons didn't all stop believing when the world didn't end in 1914. So, so thank you. Okay, uh, to reply. By the way, I, I'm not bothered. To, I, I like this. I have three responses. See, because I've made three responses, I just don't number them. But uh, that's, that's great. I think that's super. Okay. <laughs> A few, a few responses here. He says, at least two. He says, the body decomposed, I don't think we would recognize it. Totally misses the point. Today, empty tomb is the position of the vast majority of New Testament scholars. I recently took 23 arguments for the empty tomb from the critical side. And he says, well, look, come on. Your own book says 40 days before the first preaching. Wouldn't the body have decomposed? Let me tell you something. Here, this is not the Christian message. There's a body in that tomb, it's decomposed, you won't be able to tell who it is, therefore we're going to say Jesus has been raised from the dead. The, the proclamation is the tomb is empty. Here's the point, watch carefully. If there's any body in the tomb, Christians die. I'm sorry, Christian claims lose. <laughs> Christians, might, Christians might die too. So if you have a corpse there and, the, and there's holes, and the wrists and the feet, you can't make the face out because it's, I, I just mean anybody would upset the claim. And he said, no evidence that any disciple, you know, disciples might have recanted David Koresh. We don't have one lick of evidence that a disciple recanted. I'd say, produce a first century source and I'll entertain it. There aren't any. Okay. Um, can we have now a genuine 100% question for the proposition? <laughs> um, uh, gentlemen, towards the back. Hi, I'd, uh, I'd like to start off on a lighter note by asking Dr. Ahmed if three is his lucky number or something. And uh, uh, move along. <laughs> now, for, for the proposition, you spent the entire evening and you haven't answered any of the questions he's tried to put before you. Let's be honest about it. And I, I think I know why. Essentially, Dr. Ahmed here, he starts off with, uh, with a collection of rather simple, simple assumptions. He tries to make deductions from And that's not how you like to think. You like to sort of limit yourself to a collection of uh, end products. And then you try to think which one of these you sort of prefer the most. And uh, this, this really leads to the, the amount of philosophical prejudice that you show when you, you keep on... I mean, his, his point at the end is that, uh, you know, with, with this huge family of supernatural explanations, you can't seem to consider anything apart from your one special magical wizard man, God. And uh, I mean, it just, you're just really missing the point here. <laughs> I think the question is, why is it given the, um... <laughs> why is it given... Sorry if I'm rambling a bit. Given the fact that... The question they... is, do you disagree with his, his approach to thinking about the matter? Okay, that's the question. <laughs> Which is my approach, my methodology. Well, why do you disagree with the approach taken by Dr. Ahmed? The three arguments? <laughs> why did I? No, if you don't dispute a premise, he's... Okay, first of all, he asked me a lead question, I answered it. The lead question about the Bible. Then he gave three cases, and I said... Well, never mind, I'm not going to repeat all my arguments. I believe I responded all three. In the last case, I gave a very specific... I, I sort, of, sort of took the two together, but I, in the last case, I responded specifically to what I took to be a natural hallucination Object, a natural group hallucination objection, not a supernatural one. I think you lose either way on that if you can argue the naturalistic case. But that was very specific. The first two I did lump together when I made my four points about general um, arguments that I would say come from what's called antecedent probability. So I was responding to the first two, then the third, and I answered the first question about the Bible before we started. Sorry if you didn't understand my points or you didn't think I addressed them. I believe I did. To reply? Thank you. Um... I think the only thing I have to say is, is simply to observe that we still don't know which of premises 1, 2, 3 in the first argument Gary denies. We still don't know which of premises 1, 2, and 3 in the second argument Gary denies. We haven't seen any good reason, I think, for disputing premise 2 in the third argument, which is the one that he rejects, because, of course, if you're considering supernatural, supernatural hallucinations, there's no more reason to think, as far as I can see, that they're any more likely than supernatural, they're any less likely than supernatural resurrections. Okay. Um, and one final question now I think we must have um, for either side. Uh, he, he's even standing up, like clearly him. <laughs> um, 
Well, this question really is about the fact that both of you have been dancing with Hume, and it's more about the nature of knowledge, really. Um, both of you have said that you wouldn't think that just because scholars say something's true, that makes it true. And yet both of you say that the thing that would convince you is either scholarly consensus or a, uh, a rigorous scholarly run scientific experiment. Um, I was just wondering why it is that despite the fact you say you don't see sc scholars as being the major defining factor of truth, they feature so prominently in both of your um, means of, of getting convinced. Um, also, just to address your point, uh, Dr. Ahmed, um, I think one problem one could have with premise two is that, uh, is that a, a supernatural explanation is not one that is by definition unexplainable, it is merely one that isn't natural. So God could have a rationale for his activity that's merely social, so he could be doing it for moral reasons or reasons of, of agency rather than reasons of, of causality. So, yeah. Okay, so first of all, Dr. Ahmed. Thanks very much. Um, in response to the first question, I think that's a sensible point. I was merely suggesting that this is the best sort of evidence I could have for something if I wasn't there, assuming that we have a case which leaves no natural traces. If you had something like the eight days of darkness, and if they left some natural traces or some other physical traces other than merely testimony, obviously that would be much better, as most historical events, uh, most important historical events do. In reply to the second question, I agree with you that God might have reasons for preferring, for instance, resurrection to group hallucination. Um, the point was not that he might have no reasons. The point is that we have no reason, given the evidence that we actually have, for thinking any one of those is more likely than any other. So not that there are no reasons, but that our evidence gives us none. Okay. And for that. Um, I haven't said this tonight. I, I am hard of hearing. I missed almost the entire question, but I think... Please just steer me wrong. Uh, what about authorities uh, in the citing of, of uh, testimony? Was that the yes. first question? Okay. Yes, and as I said in my very, very first statement, I think my third point, was that I think it's very, very important for us to know where authorities start and begin on certain facts, not because a scholarly lay of the land determines the issue, but because if virtually all scholars agree to certain points, left, right, center, and far left, or whatever, however you characterize these, if there's a scholarly lay of the land, uh, it's a fair starting point because there are usually reasons for that scholarly lay of the land. The reasons are more important than the scholarly agreement. Um, absolutely. Um, I don't know if the second one was from me. I, I don't know if the part about hallucination. Uh, but either way, I think you're going to be in trouble. If it's, I do think it's more likely that God, you could argue that God has more reasons to do one than the other. I do not think the natural group hallucination, hallucination, hallucination hypothesis is going to work. For those of you who have been waiting for this, I will dispute the first argument, premise three. Second argument, premise three. Third argument, premise two. I thought I made a claim, claim I may not have. I think the resurrection data upset those, those points. That was my whole point. Okay. Well, I thank uh, both of our speakers very much. Um, and uh, yes, I thank you very much. Dr. And now it only remains for me to hand back to Charlie uh, to conclude this evening's proceedings. Thanks. Uh, why don't we give Sam a big round of applause as well for chairing the whole thing. <laughs> well, that's just about it. Um, thank you very much for coming. And whatever you're celebrating this Easter, I hope you have a very nice break. Thank you.